So good morning. I'd like to um, remind you of uh, the fact that we missed two lectures the first week of the uh, semester. So we'll um, we will have some makeups, um, and I would like to have them this week. So um, I was thinking of doing them um, Friday. Does anybody have? lectures on Friday morning. What, what is it, English? Yeah. What about Friday afternoon? OK, then, then we'll do them on Friday afternoon. I'll, I'll let you know at what time um, later on. Mm. There was a question last time um, after class, which I'd uh, like to come back to, in case anybody else has that um, problem. So with alloying elements, effect of alloying elements and transformations. <coughs> okay, so I these I just prepared these two slides this morning. So, and they're, they're on the um, E class, so if if you um, if you want to um, print them out or something. Um, so just just wanted to make sure you understood what um, particular chrome and molly do when when you uh, add it add them to the um, to a steel so so um, take for instance here you have a, a steel with about 0.30 percent uh, carbon mm -hmm. and uh, and this is a transformation so um, normally, the transformations are really fast. Certainly, with low carbon contents, you've got really fast transformation. So, so this is here. If um, I don't know if you see it clearly, but this this is half a second. Okay, half a second. That's very fast. And you can see here that the C curve for the start of the transformation um, is, is is shorter than half a second. So almost immediately as you cool down, you f you'll start forming. Uh, so so if, if this is a, a TTT diagram. So, so the way you have to think about it, you, you are in the austenite, you go to a certain temperature, and you look at the transformation isothermally, yes? And you can see here, um, you know, for a relatively long time, but um, say after the... the um, about a day here, uh, yeah, a few hours, uh, excuse me, so this is about an hour, two hours, three hours, three hours, you cool down, and it's all transformed to um, ferrite and, and perlite, okay? That's, that's what the, di the, the, the information in that diagram tells you. Now, it, you, t you take this, the same steel now, and you add about 2% of chrome to it, right? So, and um, I've taken this, this, this C curve here, yes, this C curve here is the curve that tells you 50% is transformed. 50% of the microstructure is transformed. <coughs> sure. So I put it here, and you can now see that the transformation, uh, the 50% transformation line has been pushed back. Yes, so all the transformations have been slowed down. Yes, that's one thing. And, um, 
And then there is another feature that's interesting. You get what is called a transformation bay. So that means if now I do the transformation, uh, for, for instance, at the temperature where the, tr the transformation was really fast, it turns out that now it's, act oops, it's, uh, it's, it's gotten much slower. Okay? That's what we call transformation bay when you add uh, these uh, uh, carbide forming um, elements such as chromium and, and moly. So, um, and here on top you form perlite uh, and um, ferrite and perlite. Yeah? Um, and um, so you, you can see here that, uh, so here you have the transformations for ferrite, yes, is, is still there, okay? So you, you, that doesn't start very much later, but the kinetics has slowed down considerably. Okay. So now, so it takes the, the transformation started at about the same time, but it, it takes much longer time to get the transformation going. Yeah, and then, and then the transformation bay. Um, Below the transformation bay, you basically get bainite transformation. Hmm? Okay, and so this is for one percent of chrome, hmm? and this is one point, um, almost two percent of, of molybdenum. You, you're basically saying the, the general uh, the, the same effect, maybe even stronger, hmm? that you push back the transformation. Now, one of the things that's that's different here is that you see here. Austenite is stable in this region here, yes, when you add chromium. When you add molybdenum, yes, there is no transformation at all, yes. So now not only is the transformation slower, but it also takes a long time before it starts, yes, okay. Okay, so. Yeah. Now, if you look carefully also, so this was the 50% uh, uh, percent transformation. You see here that the bainite transformation, yes, um, at the same temperature, yes, isn't influenced very much. Of course, it's gotten, it's gotten slower because that was the 50% line, and the 50% line is now here, yes. But you're basically going from, um, you know, 2 to 3 seconds to 20 seconds. So it's, it's slower. Yes, but uh, not much more. So, um, but you, you definitely see that the bainite transformation will be uh, preferred yeah. by uh, the molybdenum additions. Yes. Of course, if I do um, an isothermal transformation from here to here, I'm not going to get any bainite anyway, right? That's, I mean, that still stays the same. Okay. Okay. So. That's why it's important to, when, when you uh, uh, look at alloying additions, to, to think about um, uh, the transformations, um, the, the, the diagrams, but also to look, to think about what kind of heat treatment you're applying. Right? So for instance here, uh, so this is the same alloy, the original alloy, so this is the 50% the transformation curve, yes? And again, I want to, to point out the fact that the ferrite transformation already starts here, right? This is just a 50% transformation line. So this is the same line. Now I've added 1% of chrome, 1% of moly. And you can see here that the austenite stability range is now here. So combination of the chrome and the, the moly really um, slows down the reactions, ferrite reaction, the perlite reaction, yes? Okay. And so what does this mean in terms of, for instance, continuous cooling, yes? Uh, uh, these um, TTT diagrams are very useful from a, a fundamental point of view because you're looking at isothermal uh, heat treatments. 
But, but in practice, for instance, where we have a massive piece of steel which we want to heat treat, the heating rates, the cooling rates are very different, yes, in different positions in that part. So TTT diagram has a limited usefulness. So this would be a TTT diagram here for a certain complex steel here, which also contains 1% of chrome and 1% of moly, right? And as you, as you can compare these two diagrams, yes, the scales are not exactly the same, but so you see again, uh, the 50% transformation line has this bay, yes? And uh, above the bay, you have ferrite and perlite formation. Below the bay, you have bainite formation. But if you do continuous cooling, yes, yes, uh, you cannot use this diagram. You cannot use a TTT diagram. You have to use a C CT diagram. And there, you basically track. You have to choose a cooling rate. Yes? Say, for instance, we use this cooling rate. Uh, this diagram tells me that here, I start the transformation to ferrite, yes? There is 40%, excuse me, 10% is transformed to ferrite here. Yeah? And then we start making um, a little bit of uh, perlite, yes? The, trans the total transformation at this, this point here is 70%, yeah? And then as I continue cooling down, due in this, I'm basically going through this transformation bay. There is no transformation for a while, yes? No transformation for a while. And then the transformation starts again at lower temperature. It's a bainite transformation, yes? And then we go to uh, another 30% of volume is transformed to uh, uh, bainite, yes? And then you cool down, okay? All right. So I, I, I hope this is this. Uh, uh, clear. So now let's uh, continue where we w where we ended last week, and we've been talking about. Um, grain size uh, reductions and how this was done with uh, thermomechanical processing and um, I think when I, I stopped we were talking about uh, the fact that in um, many steels, in use, uh, structural steels, uh, in particular the ones that are used in the uh, construction industry for buildings, uh, the, the basic strengthening is by carbon. But, but what you are actually uh, strengthening the steel with is with this perlite. The perlite. When you add carbon, you increase the amount of carbi carbides in the perlite. You increase the amount of volume fraction of, of perlite, and, and that makes the this, this steel real stronger. So it's very, it, and it's very much a composite, the perlite itself. It's, it contains very strong cementite and, and much softer ferrite, and the, the maximum UTS you have is about a gigapascal. And we, we saw this here. Hmm? When you have 100% perlite, you have a gigapascal. So, and I had just uh, finished the lecture by saying, um, if you want to have a larger um, strength with perlite, that's possible. However, uh, these very high carbon contents makes these material um, uh, very uh, difficult to weld. It was one thing. And then the other thing is um, the way you would make this perlite very strong would be by reducing the interlamellar spacing. Yes, and technologically you can do this, but usually for wire-like products. So if you want to make sheet products, it's, you can't really work with, with high levels of perlite, and you have to think about other methods to change the microstructure and to get very high strengths. Yeah? And it turns out that you can, with steels, 
uh, achieve very high strengths with very low carbon contents also. So and that's the way in which new product development goes these days. But let's say uh, a few things about this, uh, the, the effect of carbon. Um, so if we increase the carbon content, uh, we increase the amount of perlite. Uh, so you can see here, less than, if I have hypo eutectoid uh, carbon contents, less than 0.77, our uh, matrix is basically ferrite, soft ferrite. If I have more than 0.77 carbon, um, now uh, you can see here uh, I have uh, hard, brittle, uh, grain boundary uh, cementite, and, and most of the microstructure is perlitic. The rest of uh, microstructure is perlitic. So um, because we've added this, these very high levels of, uh, uh, with higher levels of carbon, I increase the amount of perlite in the microstructure. I see the yield strength increasing. I see the tensile strength increasing. Yes. Um, but uh, what I see is that um, the elongation goes down, yes, and the toughness of the material uh, goes down. Uh, toughness measured as the impact energy um, when you're doing um, a sharp P test, uh, which we'll talk about later if you're not um, familiar with the sharp P test. So, uh, so this is another way of, of presenting this, this increase in hardness is that um, as you add uh, perlite, you get uh, more uh, hardness, yes? The finer the perlite, the harder the perlite is. That's the way you, you basically increase the strength of uh, a perlitic steel. You need to refine the microstructure. You get very small interlamellar spacings, yes? If you have coarse perlite, the strength is less, and if you have spherodite, where the, the, the carbide is present not in the perlite, but as uh, separate and, uh, spherical uh, cementite, the material is even softer. And then, but the advantage, of course, is when things are softer, they're usually more ductile. Okay? Um, the Martin site, Yes, you can make at all these carbon contents, yeah, at all these carbon contents, you can make um, martensite. You can quench the material and you find that uh, you can have a tremendous increase in strength, yes. Here again, um, the problem with this very high uh, level of strength is that because you get it from supersaturated carbon, yes, the material is brittle, yes? It doesn't really have uh, any uh, much formability. So, um, so it's much stronger than the, the same material with ferrite-perlite uh, mixture. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, these, um, and, and you can see this, this is a large uh, range of carbon content is used, uh, is used in practice. Hmm? So for instance, files, you, I don't know what, if you know what a file is, it's something to uh, you know, smoothen metal with a metal file. It's like something like this. And it has all these teeth like this. So you can file down uh, an object, yes? Uh, these are very, very high carbon steels almost 1.5% of, of carbon, or very, very hard martensite in them, yes? Um, so, um, and, and, and there you use, you know, basically this approach. You have huge amount of carbon in supersaturation, very strong uh, material. Um, but in many applications, it doesn't work, yes? It doesn't work because you do, you, you, you do want some um, plasticity, formability. So um, one of the ways you can do this is by uh, tempering the martensite. Uh, when you do that, the material becomes softer. Hmm? As, as, as you, this is the tempering temperature. You can see the, the yield strength goes down, tensile strength goes down, and the 
reduction of area if, if you uh, uh, measure the reduction of the section at, uh, of a sample increases. And what happens is during the, this, this tempering, uh, here you see a lath martensite microstructure. So these are the laths of the martensite. And you see there's a, they're all little speckles in the um, microstructure. That's not an etching effect. Well, it is an etching effect. But these are basically uh, small carbides that are formed in the microstructure when the carbon goes out of solid solution. Very small carbides. Okay. So, in conclusion, the austenite, uh, as a rule, you, you know, you can cool it slowly, you can cool it moderately, you can cool it rapidly. If you do a rapid quench, you get martensite. It's usually reheated to obtain tempered martensite with very fine carbides, which allows you to uh, get a very hard material that's, that's, that does have some toughness. Moderate cooling will give you bainite. Again, the microstructure looks very similar to that of, of martensite. Um, but, but during the transformation, you do have motion of um, uh, carbon. Carbon uh, can diffuse during the bainite transformation. And if you do a relatively slow cooling, you get either ferrite or ferrite perlitic microstructure. Um, and um, the, most of the steels that we use are uh, hypoeutectoid, so you get proeutectoid ferrite in the microstructure. Mm -hmm. And as a rule, you can, you can say, well, martensite is stronger than tempered martensite, bainite, fine perlite, coarse perlite, and spherodite. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Um, the microstructures that um, are uh, produced during processing of steel, yes, um, can be uh, in a state of, in a strained state. Uh, so and that's basically the, the big difference between hot working and cold working. When you hot work a material, for instance, uh, in a hot strip mill, you get material recrystallizes. It takes less energy to deform at high temperature. There may be some oxidation, yes, uh, and the material has lower strength. And uh, Usually, after processing at high temperature, you have your material is recrystallized. Yes? It's not the case with uh, cold working. There is no recrystallization in general, so it takes more energy to deform. There's less oxidation at surface, so that means that products that are cold deformed usually have a very good surface finish. That's also the reason why um, we do cold deformation, because of the uh, surface finish and the control of the dimensions of the product. You have increased strength. You get cold work microstructures such as the, the micrograph you see here, um, which are anisotropic, meaning that there is this, this anisotropy of properties is usually the result of texture, uh, crystallographic texture um, being uh, created. So you can see here, you can, you can see the grains and you can see slip lines in these, slip traces in these grains that tell you uh, that this is a cold worked microstructure. So um, this is a, a microstructure here um, where you can see the grain. This is hot rolled microstructure. Many stainless steels, uh, when they're hot, um, hot deformed do not recrystallize very well. So in this particular case, there's an example of a hot worked a microstructure that is not recrystallized. So after annealing, these uh, very fine grains and the highly deformed pancake grains are replaced by uh, more equiaxed grains, as you can see here. And so you need uh, recrystallization and recrystallization is recrystallization annealing is one of the um, um, heat treatments um, that we uh, apply during um, 
processes that we generally refer to as annealing. So, in, um, so you have to be very careful in, uh, when you use the word annealing or you hear the word annealing in reference to steels because there are many different things. It can mean many different things, yes? Uh, so, uh, so annealing, you, you basically heat the material up, you steal up at a certain temperature, and you hold it for a certain time before cooling. Yeah? So uh, all these, the, the parameters that may seem obvious, but the heating rate, the holding time, the, 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 the soaking temperature, and the cooling rates are all important parameters, yes? And that will, they will give you a variety of microstructures. So there are different types of annealing. Stress relief annealing, yes. It reduces stresses caused by plastic deformation, a non-uniform cooling, and phase transformations, yes. Uh, what does the stress relief do? It's basically, um, in a, from a physical metallurgy point of view, you basically reduce internal stresses which are present in the material by recovery processes. So you, and recovery processes are processes whereby you rearrange the dislocations in low energy configurations. Spheroidization, you, that's, you already know this, is to make very soft steels, steels that normally would contain perlite. Why would you make that? Well, for instance, to make the plastic deformation easier, easy machining, yes? And you heat the steel up, yes, just below the eutectoid temperature for a very long time, because it takes a, a long time to uh, spheroidize the, um, the carbides. And it also takes a very long time because you cannot go to higher temperature. If you'd go to a higher temperature, you would basically dissolve the carbides, yes? And so nothing would happen. Full anneal. Hmm? Uh, makes a steel uh, uh, good uh, for forming hmm? uh, by heating and cooling it in a furnace to get coarse perlite. Normalization is uh, uh, very important. Hmm? So the um, steel hmm? uh, uh, properties depend on grain size. You can um, refine the grain size by going through a transformation and back when you heat and you cool. That allows you to uh, get smaller uniform grains. And then you also have process anneal, which is uh, basically uh, removing re uh, recrystallization annealing. You remove the negative effects of cold working by uh, recovery and usually by full recrystallization. So, so this is the, basically the, the big difference. So if I look at the um, um, iron-rich side of the iron carbon diagram, hmm, a normalization involves full transformation. Yes. Um, so you go over the AE1 temperature. Yes. Don't forget that if if this is a fast normalization, yes, um, the AE3 temperature has to be, uh, you have to go higher than this temperature because the A, uh, uh, C3 uh, is, it will be higher than AE3. Yeah? So, if I, so you know that uh, this would be AC3. Yes. Temperatures. Okay. Um, so um, you can have, excuse me, a process anneal. Then you really heat the material up, so it recrystallizes, but it, you don't want it to transform, right? So you keep the temperature to below AE1. Yes, you don't, want, you don't want transformation. You just want recrystallization of the ferrite, for instance, yes? So, and usually that's a pretty rapid process. Remember, it takes, it takes only um, you know, uh, of the order of 
uh, seconds to, um, to get a material, a ferrite, the deformed ferrite to recrystallize. So it goes pretty rapidly. Um, the, um, here, the stress relief only requires recovery. Yes? So you don't go to very high temperatures because you don't want to achieve recrystallization. And finally, spheroidization requires a very long time at a temperature right below AE1. Again, you cannot go higher because then you dissolve your carbide. Yes? That's why you have to stay at this temperature. And that's also one of the reasons why it takes such a long time. OK, so at this stage, we've done some general discussion about you know, the physical metallurgy that we need to know for the, the course. So uh, some general things about compositions and crystal structure and um, transformation and relationship between microstructure and strength. And so and, and we'll be able to use this uh, whenever we discuss uh, processing of steels, technical processing of steels, and the decomposition of austenite comes into the picture. Hmm? Okay? And, so the, and that will help us understand why you use particular industrial processing parameters, yes? And not other ones. Hmm? Hmm? All right. So the... We um, <coughs> continue now with... The um, another small introductory uh, part, which is about steel standards, because you need to know a few things about um, steels, um, steel standards for this course, so you, you're a little bit more familiar with um, um, using names of um, materials. So. Uh, some of you are in research, yes. Um, most of the materials that you know you're, you're dealing with are non-technical materials, you know, alloys that you make yourself, yes, uh, for for research purposes. In the real world, it's very different. You're not supposed to be too creative, right? You're supposed to, you know, when a steel needs to be produced in large amount, it's according to a standard, yes. And even if you're very smart, yes, you're not allowed to do experiments on production, yes? So it's very important to realize that, you know, these steel standards are extremely important in, in processing because they identify a steel grade. Hmm? And it guarantees product quality and reliability and interchangeability. Hmm? And usually there's... Uh, coherent, they're simple, and they're a convenient way, and they provide a specific name under the form of symbols, numbers, letters, or combinations of these that allow you, you know, the engineer, to see uh, you know, what is the composition of the material, what are mechanical properties that are certified when uh, clients purchase uh, materials. Yeah? Okay, so we'll say a few things about that, yes, um, and, um, and and don't forget um, the the uh, of course research does have influence on these standards, but they're much more uh, controlled by professional engineer engineering societies, trade associations, government re regulatory bodies, etc., hmm? rather than by research. Okay, so um, what are we, uh, so all the metals and alloys are subject to the same type of standardization, right? And, and so we, uh, what we are talking about today are uh, the ferrous alloys and the ones that contain less than 2% of carbon. Hmm? So we're not talking about cast irons or other things, yes? All right, and um, so all these products here, uh, tube, plates, sheet, sections, bar, wires, etc. When customer uh, purchases these, yes, it's always according to specifications, yes? 
Okay? So, um, what does that mean? The composition, of course, thermal processing, mechanical processing, and very much important are application properties. That guarantees the grade, uh, uh, the, the properties that go along with the grade specification. Okay. And that can cover a very wide, you know, a product specification can cover a very wide array of elements. So not only um, mechanical properties and composition, but you know, they can be geometrical properties to your product, dimensions, um, shape of the product. Uh, there can be, uh, in certain cases, microstructural properties, requirements. Hmm? Composition is one of them. And there can be other technical uh, requirements. For instance, weldability, phosphateability, drawability, roughness, friction, and in certain cases, magnetic or electrical properties. Hmm? All right. So let me, let me give you an example of, uh, now, the, let me just go back just a second here. Yeah. Um, these requirements here, yes, uh, that go into the product, they're produced in plants, in an industri you know, by combination of, of course, industrial plant, the approach to processing, raw materials that you use, the way you control and automate your, pro your, uh, your product, and of course, in the steel industry, very important, the um, IT infrastructure, because it's a very highly automated uh, industry. Okay? So, um, usually, you're, uh, in the grade specifications, yes, um, performance is important. So, an engineer uh, that... Um, uh, require steel for a building, yes, will need certain mechanical properties, yes, which are numbers, yes. For instance, we'll have a minimum yield strength of this much, yes, and he specifies this, yes. That property, that number, rather, is, is a property, yes. These megapascal may uh, be related to strength, yes, for instance. Um, the strength is related to the microstructure of your material, yes? And depending on the situation, it can be different parts of the microstructure, yes? And a combination of this, and this microstructure is obtained by processing the material, okay? So let's have a look at an example of how does this work. Hmm? So these are, these are great specific technical requirements. Okay. So let's have an example. Okay. For instance, um, a, a client may be automotive company, and, and automotive company uh, purchases uh, steel, for instance, for press forming. Yes, for press forming. So uh, they will require um, specific uh, R values. Remember what R value is? The ratio of the width to the uh, thickness strain if you make a tensile sample out of a sheet material, yes? So that, that company will, will say, I want this R value, minimum, 1.5 minimum, yes? So that means that anything that um, you as a steel maker uh, supply, if uh, a random sample is taken, the R value has to be 1.5 minimum, yes? Okay. Now, that is a formability property, yes? It, it, has, it has nothing to do with, with hardness or, or strength. It's a formability property, yes? Okay. The structure, it's, in terms of the structure, it's related to crystallographic texture, yes? And in the processing, yes, vacuum degassing plays a role, 
in this um, crystallographic texture. The alloying plays a role. The cold rolling and the annealing process play a role in the, um, obtaining the right formability through Langford uh, parameter and, and a Langford parameter in, um, at your clients. So this is what we call steel design, yes? So if you have a client, say a car maker, who has a problem, makes, is making a, is pressing panels and there are some cracks in the panel, yes, and your client then makes a test and it turns out that his R value, the material, doesn't have the R value that you promised, yes? You can explain, do all kinds of explaining you want, yes, but you're in trouble, yes? Because you didn't provide material according to specifications, yes? And it doesn't matter how much science you have, yes? It's, if it's not according to specifications, you can take back the material and you can pay for all the damage that you've caused the client, yes? So specifications are, are not uh, laughing matter. It's very important, yes? Okay. So what, what form does this take in practice, okay? Well, this is, for instance, a, um, a specification, yes? Um, it's a um, coiled uh, roll uh, coil here. It's ready for shipping to, uh, from production. So what can we learn from the label? Yes. So it says, well, it says where it's going to. Um, you can also see it's paid by POSCO. And then the steel, it says the steel. It says the dimensions of the steel. Yes. And uh, the weight of the coil, 11 tons. Yes. 11 530 uh, kilos there. So, but it says just G3131 SPHC, that's, that's the grade, yes? And attached to this grade are a lot of specifications, yes? So, just is um, very common in Asia um, because um, it's, it's a very well um, uh, very widely used Japanese uh, steel grade name, yes, and um, it's um, G3131 is the um, uh, say the reference if you want. So it's it's for it's the the reference document for hot uh, rolled mild steels, and SPHG stands for S stands for steel, P for plain carbon. H for hot rolled, and C for commercial quality, yes? So that means it's a steel with regular properties, yes? Um, it's very important that um, you realize that even though this is not a very special steel, yes, um, it does um, cost um, money, yes? So it costs about $620 uh, dollars per ton, yes? So a coil like this, um, you know, easily goes into the thousands of dollars, yes? And that's a very basic quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are additional costs, of course, for, you know, who pays for um, transportation and for the insurance, etc. Okay, so let's have a look. Now, once we have a specification, like, like this one, so this is a very common structural steel, and does not contain special alloying additions. That's usually what means uh, uh, this commercial quality. So in Japan, um, we have uh, this grade name. In the US, we have the equivalent 
grade has another name. And in Europe, it's called an S-275, yes? Okay, and this is the typical compositions. You can see uh, maximum 0.6 um, manganese, 0.15 carbon. In terms of the uh, composition, it's not a very tough one to make. Hmm? Now, you see another advantage here of um, uh, standards is, is you can sell products in other countries, yes? Because great specifications can be compared, yes? And you can identify equivalent um, grades in different countries. Now, in, in the world in general, uh, there were like three big blocks of strong uh, standards. In Asia, it's uh, GIS. In uh, Europe, it's EN. And in, in North America, it's a little bit complex. There are lots of uh, engineering and trade associations that have their own um, uh, specification. I will say a few things about this. But ASTM, uh, um, SAE, AIST, AI, AISI, excuse me, are uh, typical um, um, bodies that issue um, specifications. Okay, another one here. Uh, now it's on a billet. Yes, so steel products don't have to be um, finished bars or finished wire or finished sheet. Uh, uh, steel industry can sell intermediate products such as slabs or billets or um, slabs, slabs and billets. This is an example here. It's a, it's a continuous cast billet yeah? and it also has a sticker here. Yes, and in this particular case, is, is, uh, will be used to uh, make wire rod, yes, and that can then be used to make ball bearings, nuts and bolts, wire, tire cord, spring, etc. Again, you see um, GIS, uh, G4105, so that, that's the, the reference document for this type of steels, and then the, the grade name. So this, so this, you have the standard code and then you have the number um, SCM440. What does this mean? Again, there's lots of information in the, uh, in the symbol. Well, first of all, we know it's, it's Japanese. S stands for steel, yes, uh, which tells you, of course, that JIS is not only about steel. It, it also has issues, standards for aluminum and other materials, yes. A C stands for chromium steel and M stands for molybdenum. Hmm? So you can very quickly, if you're in the, in, in the field, you can uh, see this. Hmm? Again, um, once you know, so this is a, a common medium carbon steel and it's alloyed with chrome and molybdenum. So we know why we add chrome and molybdenum to increase hardenability. Yes? And uh, so this steel can, for instance, be used to make um, hardened, high-strength bolts. Yeah? And here you see bolts, this type of bolts, uh, for instance, that are used to, uh, uh, in, in construction. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll say a few things how you make these bolts. Yeah? So, but again, um, it, once you know the Japanese uh, uh, standard name, you know the, the corresponding one in um, the US and in, in Europe, yes? Now you'll see, um, if you look carefully, there is the GIS ends with 40, the uh, American, in this particular case, AISI SAE um, specification ends with 40, and the European uh, normalization um, for steel has a uh, starts with 42. Yes. This refers to the carbon content times 100. Yes. So the carbon content of this particular steel is about 0.4 percent. Yes. The European um, uh, standard code also tells you 
that the C here and the M here are chrome and moly. So the full chemical symbol is written out in, in contrast to the Japanese where, where, it's, where you have to know that C means chrome. Yeah. And then you have an additional number here of four, yes, which gives you more information about the composition in the case of the European uh, normalization scheme. So uh, if you look at this, you can see 0 0.42 mass percent of carbon. This symbol is four times the uh, chromium content. I'll, I'll tell you in a moment why, why we, multi we divide by four. And then it also has molybdenum additions. Yes? Okay. Um, here. But they are not, we don't know how much. Okay. So this is the symbol. And there are other symbols in, in, in Europe, also number symbols, which are equivalent to uh, the SAE approach. Why is it that um, uh, we, we don't write 1% here? It's because many times um, your, um, um, your concentrations, alloy concentrations, are, are low in steels. Yeah? They can be like 1.5 or they can be 0.5, yes? Now, when you're uh, purchasing steel, yes, you have to write paper, lots of paperwork, yes, and you want to avoid making errors, yes, and it's very easy to make errors if you use decimal points or commas, yes, and in order to avoid using decimal points or commas, yes, in Europe, in these standard issues, we multiply with a convenient number so that you end up not having to use commas, yes? And in particular, like additions of chromium or molybdenum or manganese, yes? Um, the, uh, uh, you, you multiply these elements with four. That's, yeah. So, um, so for instance, in Europe, uh, you have, if I say, for instance, steel 22NMB5, yes? Um, it means that this is carbon times 100. So the carbon content is 22 divided by 100. So it's 0.22% of carbon. It contains manganese and boron. Yes. The number always refers to this element, to the first one in the row. It doesn't refer to boron. Yes. But you can, you can tell that it contains both manganese and boron as special additions, yes? Now, the manganese is like the carbon, excuse me, it's like the chrome and the moly, it's, it's multiplied by four, yeah? So the, the actual content is five divided by four is 1.25% of manganese, okay? That's what it means, okay? And not like I've heard some people say, it means five ppm of boron. No, okay, it's nothing to do hmm? with uh, the boron content, okay? Right, so, so um, the specifications, yes, but when you have a piece of material, yes, it has a composition, yes? Okay, Th so the specifications never give you a single composition you get a composition ranges. Yeah? For instance, uh, uh, this here is a, the composition range for SCM440, according to GIS, yes? Okay, so you, your composition has to be within this range, and here below you have typical, typical values for a product like this. Yeah? And it, this, again, is, a, is very widely used a uh, type of steel for uh, many applications. Uh, it has uh, relatively, um, um, because of the high carbon content, relatively high carbon, uh, you need to be careful when you weld this material. You need to have some preheating and stress relief after welding. But otherwise very widely used. Um, for instance, to make um, Bolts, yes. How do you make bolts with this material? You start, the, so the company, a company like POSCO will, that produces wire steel will be 
producing, uh, this is an example here what the numbers are for 435. So as how much carbon is in there instead of 0 0.4, 0 0.35, yes? Um, the material has this strength when it's produced, 900 to uh, 1100 megapascal. So you first do uh, a soft annealing of this microstructure. Um, so, yes, and uh, you do this because you want to adjust the diameter of the wire to the diameter you need to make bolts, yes, to, to produce bolts. Then you spherodize, so then uh, you spherodize the microstructure. This is the uh, spherodization. The material is now much, much softer. Instead of being 900 to 1,000, it's 500 to 600 megapascal. So you can do cold forming of the wires. So you make little pieces of this wire, and then you form it. You basically cold forge it into a bolt, yes? It's a very soft bolt. It doesn't have good mechanical properties. So you do, you now, um, <coughs> yeah, I think battery is low. Um, so you, um, uh, austenitize it, you quench it, and then you do a, um, um, a tempering to get um, you, some of the toughness back that you have lost, if you, that you don't have if you have purely martensitic microstructure, okay? Okay, so this is the a big step here. You, you spherodize the microstructure of this type of steel so that you can cold form bolts with it, hmm? okay? It's a process, this ferrodization, again, I want to point out, is a process that takes a lot of time. And one of the reasons why it takes a lot of time, for instance, in this SCM440 or SCM435, is the fact that because you have added molybdenum and chromium to make the steel hardenable, this ferrodization also takes a long time because the chrome goes into these carbides and um, they will influence the uh, spherodization kinetics, all right? So this is the bolt, usually very hard material. The nuts is, not, is made from different material, yes, uh, which is shown here. Uh, so with a specification comes a lot of information also about this, the material, right? So for instance, um, once you know the, the, the grade specification, you can uh, find the, the way you have to heat treat the material, yes? The, the client then. Mm -hmm. And so that's another reason why, um, it, it, certainly in engineering steels, it's very important to have, uh, to have this specification because, uh, for instance, for this, spec this uh, grade here, yes? This is the uh, CCT diagram. So the um, uh, bolt maker yeah, that uh, will have to make the quench and tempering, quench, the quenching and the tempering, knows that um, all the critical temperatures that he has to adhere to form a martensitic microstructure. For instance, you can see here that the cooling rate uh, uh, when he makes the bolt, the cooling rate will have to be of the order of 36 degrees per second, yes, for him to achieve uh, a fully uh, martensitic microstructure. Okay. This other example here, yes, this is an uh, AISI 5120. So again, uh, we know that the, fifth, the, the 20 here stands for uh, the carbon content, yes? Um, this is a, an American uh, or an SAE um, uh, grade. It has an equivalent GIS name, uh, SCR422. So again, it doesn't come as a surprise, the 22. That's 22 uh, carbon. SCR. 
means it's JIS, so this is it's steel, and CR stands for chrome. So it's a chrome added uh, um, steel with uh, 0.22 uh, uh, carbon, so it's going to be used for engineering application. This particular case, um, it's, it's used to make gears. You can see, and, and the way it's being done, uh, again, you start with um, a billet, for instance, uh, uh, which is cut and forged and machined, yes? And then you have heat treatments, which can consist of carburizing to make these um, teeth, the gear teeth, uh, very um, strong and wear resistant, yes? Then you quench and you temper and you have this final product here, yes? So what's the key addition here is the chromium. And, 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 and why is that? Well, because we want hardenability. We want these gears to be very um, uh, strong. And so we achieve this by... Um, so in the two examples I've um, given, uh, hardenability was important, and chromium and the molybdenum. Um, there, depending on pro other products, you get other emphasis, yes, which comes out through in, in the um, in the specification. For instance, for rails, yes, uh, rails are um, uh, usually referred to as uh, UIC grades, yes, and that's a French um, UIC stands for uh, Union Internationale des Chemins de Fer. It means a uh, International Union of Railroads, yes, and a number. Yeah? So you, when you see UIC, you absolutely always know it's a it's a it's a rail steel, yes. And the sixty, yes, uh, oddly enough, is related to the shape of the rail, yes, yes. And the shape of the rail. So if if you have a certain shape, yes, of the rail a one meter of that rail will have a certain weight, yes? So 60 means that uh, the mass of one meter of the rail of that product is, is 60, yeah? Um, that's one way to do things. Um, why is it so important? Well, obviously, uh, uh, you have different types of rails, yes? To you, it may look like they're all the same, but uh, they're very different. Uh, so nowadays, with, uh, for instance, in Europe, uh, when um, you develop a very uh, large um, distances of uh, high-speed trains, you have to make sure that the trains can go from one track to the other track in other countries, right? So it's, it's important that you know, they all have the same shape and um, all the same type of materials. Yeah? So there are European uh, uh, specifications for rails, yes? And um, the 13,674 here, and some uh, uh, examples, R200, R220, R260, etc. There the number is related to the hardness of the uh, material. Hardness according to the Brunel hardness, yes? And uh, why, why is the hardness important in the case of rails? Well, because of uh, friction and wear. That's, that's the reason, yes? Uh, but, of course, when, when you have these numbers, um, there are, according to the, the specification, strengths requirements. From the, uh, typical requirements are of the order 1,300 megapascal and um, certain composition requirements, such as uh, low enough phosphorus content so you don't have um, embrittlement. Yeah? Again, um, with, with rails, you have uh, rails that are used for cranes, yes? rails that are used for light transport, for trams, for subways, are, they all have their own specifications. Yes? And um, rails are continuously replaced. Yes, because they wear out. You can't, you yeah. know, so it's big business. Yes, because once you have a railway, it means that, you know, every so often the rails need to be uh, replaced with new ones. Yes, because 
Um, um, another example here, C70S6, yeah, um, is a, um, a steel that's uh, engineering steel that's often used um, to make connecting rods. And you know what connecting rod is? It connects your crankshaft to the piston in your motor of the car. This is a standard way of making these connecting rods. Nowadays, um, we actually use the brittleness of martensite to make these connecting rods very quickly and very cheaply. So if you look carefully at this um, rod here, this connecting rod, uh, and you look at the at the surface here, it looks like it's fractured. And it is fractured. It's broken. It's broken in a brittle way on purpose. Because, um, you see, you need to put this, you need to mount this around your crankshaft, right? So you need to open it. Right? So the way you do it is by, you make notches here, you make a, a fracture notch, and then you break it here, yes, and then the two parts fit perf <coughs> the two parts fit perfectly. You don't need to have any machining. Yeah? It's very rapid. Um, so you would want to have a steel that is uh, um, very high strength, but it also has this brittle, yeah, and so that's why you use this this steel part C seven. S6. So the, um, the, the 7, and this is a <coughs> European um, uh, standard, the great spec. Uh, the 7 P stands for uh, 0.7 uh, carbon, so it's very high carbon. Yeah? And then you can see the, the sulfur is also high. And that's the reason why we have high sulfur, is to allow for machining of this, uh, this thing. So uh, you've probably been told ever so often that in steels, elements such as sulfur is very bad and it has to be extremely low for this and that reason. But there are many cases, in particular engineering steel, where we add the sulfur because it makes the, the steel more easy to machine. So this is a very nice example where, where you actually make use of the, the brittleness of martensite to, uh, to make um, a, um, a product um, very uh, cost effectively. Right, so, so this is a, a small overview of um, just standards, yes? For instance, you have the alloy steels, chrome, Chrome moly, nickel chrome, nickel chrome moly, uh, and you see here some examples: S chrome 430, SCM 430. This one contains moly and chrome. SNC 631. So you you, you know it's a uh, alloy steel, or engineering steel with nickel and chrome, containing 0.31 carbon, and this is nickel. Body. Yes. And again, advantage of having uh, standards is you know you can look for the equivalent product, and that means that uh, that means that steel is uh, a global business. You, know, you can basically buy your engineering steel from anywhere, uh, and according to the standards. And you know, for structural steels, it's, it's different. Spring steels, bearing steels are, are shown here. So again, the last two digits, carbon content times 100. Why do we, again, you know, why not the carbon content? Because you would have to use decimal points. Um, and so this is more convenient. Uh, I'm going to say a few more things about European norm standards because 
the um, European countries have worked very hard over the years to unify you know, the, the different standards in very many countries, Germany, France, England, all had their uh, own standards. It's been a little rather successful, I would think, this effort of standardization. Uh, there are two ways to classify steels in, in this um, uh, way. And so the first classification group is based on a single letter code, um, which is related to the, the application, and a number code, a number code which is related to the proper, specific property. So, uh, and what can, what can these properties be? Uh, mechanical properties, such as the yield strength, and these uh, uh, codes that we use, this letter code, um, is usually the first letter of the application. Okay? So S means structural steel, B means drawing steel, H, high strength steel, P, pressure vessel, T, pin plate, M, electrical steels with specific magnetic uh, properties. Okay? Yeah. And then they, there is another other way to specify the grades in uh, steel grades in Europe, uh, and, and that is entirely based on composition. Yeah, so, if you see that grade name, you know the uh, you know the main elements, and you can imagine what applications there are. And there are four subgroups in these in this classification. C means unalloyed with a manganese content less than. Uh, one weight percent. Okay, so let's just go back. Remember, see, C seventy S six, right? That's one of these. This is a European, and it says carbon 0 0.7 manganese mm -hmm. content. So that's the way it will look. So the C here stands for unalloyed less than one percent in the weight of manganese. Nothing means unalloyed with manganese compounds larger than 1%, but less than 5% in of any other element. X means that they're alloying to a level higher than 5% for one of the elements, or at least. Yeah? And HS means high speed steel. And those are steels that are used for machining, yes? tools, and they will always contain combination of tungsten, cobalt, moly, and vanadium. Yes? So that's, uh, these are tool steels. Yes? So let me give you an example here. Let's look at an example S. So S355, yes? JR plus M. Yeah. So if you get this specific, if, if steel is ordered according to this specification, yes, it means that it's a structural steel. Yeah. Um, 355 is the minimum yield strength in megapascal. Yes. JR refers to toughness specification. Yeah. So it's going to be, it's a steel that is will be used for instance at lower temperature and you want to uh, uh, make sure it's not brittle. Yes? And in this particular case, the toughness specification as measured by the V-notch impact test and the R tells me that this, the specification of a room temperature. Yeah? And then plus N, that means the material has to be normalized. So there are um, required, in addition to name of the grade, the mechanical properties, there are requirement symbols, additional requirement symbols here related to toughness, and then extra symbols related to process, thermal treatment, coatings, etc. Okay, let's uh, finish here. Thank you for your attention. And we'll continue uh, on Thursday with these uh, specifications. And so, uh, please plan to, to be uh, here 
Friday afternoon, sometime. And we'll do the two, two hours together.